The coronation of King Charles III in the magnificent surroundings of Westminster Abbey was deeply religious. It paid respect to Britain's ongoing commitment to Christianity through liturgy, readings, hymns and symbolism. I'm sure it would be confounding for those who espouse a post-Christian era. At the outset of the service, in one of the most poignant moments of the entire ceremony, the King was greeted by 14-year-old Samuel Strachan with the words, Your Majesty, as children of the Kingdom of God, we welcome you in the name of the King of Kings. And in reply, King Charles identified with Jesus saying, In his name and after his example, I come not to be served, but to serve. Your Majesty, as children of the Kingdom of God, we welcome you in the name of the King of Kings. In his name and after his example, I come not to be served, but to serve. Jesus, of course, is the ultimate example of true servant leadership and how different would the global scene be if all leaders followed his example. But from this uh, humble statement at the commencement of the coronation, the king appeared to be across every detail, right down to his final act, prior to exiting the abbey, of greeting leaders of other religions in recognition of the multi-faith nation over which he is monarch. This was in keeping with his declaration in 1994 that he would change the title given to Britain's monarch since the 16th century from Defender of the Faith to the Defender of Faith. Now, for this reason, at his coronation, King Charles recited a new pledge promising to seek to foster an environment in which people of all faiths and beliefs may live freely. And I believe rightly so, as it's in keeping with the Christian worldview that he espouses, which surely requires him to care about religious freedom for all. In my role, I've had the privilege of advocating on behalf of Christians whose ability to freely practice their faith has been curtailed by bad government policies or social pressure. But my faith also compels me to defend the freedom of others. In fact, the fundamental human right to religious freedom is the product of a fully formed Christian worldview. Jesus said that loving your neighbour is second only to loving God, and that's not dependent on whether or not our beliefs align. Religious freedom is a human right that we are compelled to protect and promote for all people. It's an important aspect of fulfilling the church's call to love our neighbours as ourselves. And this is particularly relevant right now in our nation where hostility to religion is increasing and religious discrimination is a genuine issue. Around 30% of Australians report having experienced discrimination because of their religious views, with younger generations even more likely to be the targets of hate. Research by notable academics involving a qualitative study over 13 years considered the experience of four main faith communities, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism and Judaism. And their report included harrowing stories of Jewish and Muslim students whose hijabs or kippahs were mocked and even physically ripped from their heads, Hindus being bullied for wearing Hindi symbols or having the bindi which is the coloured dot on their forehead. Christians suffering from prejudice and discrimination. Jews being subject to Nazi salutes and highly offensive anti-Semitic slurs online or in graffiti. And this is the environment in which we are advocating for laws that will protect religious freedom. And I'm sure it's why the government has indicated that they will include anti-vilification laws in any religious discrimination bill. But there's a danger in this scenario. Supposedly designed to promote greater harmony and tolerance, anti-vilification laws often produce the opposite results. Aimed at promoting cultural diversity, these laws can become a legal vehicle for one group to silence any opposing debate from another by claiming that they, rather than their beliefs, are being attacked. Some describe uh, religious vilification laws as newly invented thought crimes, and it's, it's hard not to agree Sadly, we live in an age where having a difference of opinion can be viewed as hateful. But in an egalitarian society such as ours, there's got to be a place for non-prejudicial differences of opinion. Christians and people of various faiths and cultural communities should not be restricted from, ex from expressing their beliefs both verbally and online. An example would be uh, the Christian's belief that Jesus is the only pathway to God. 
This requires us to believe that anything that denies that is false. And we obviously want to share this because of our love for others and our desire for them to find God. As Christians, we should always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who inquires about the reason for our hope. But this is not a license to be objectionable, quite the opposite. New Testament writers repeatedly counseled against using aggressive, disparaging words. Instead, they urged the utmost courtesy. We are told to answer with gentleness and respect. And in terms of the proper Christian attitude, if we incur insult or vitriol from others, Jesus said to bless those who curse you. So the best response to hate speech, racial, religious or any other, is not to censor it, but to expose it and answer it. Education, public debate and ongoing dialogue between religious communities is a far more effective means to achieve a climate of mutual respect and tolerance. And it's incumbent on every one of us to promote a culture of kindness and of decency. I'm convinced that there is a broad desire to promote religious freedom, uh, but the way to achieve this is not by banning all potentially provocative speech. What is required is legislation to ensure all Australians are protected from discrimination on the basis of religious belief or activity, just as we are already protected from discrimination on the basis of age, sex, race and disability. So as our government considers in the coming months how they will frame their bill, it's important that what they come up with will advance and not restrict religious freedom. You know, over 61% of Australians identify as religious, but any legislation that restricts religious freedom will affect every Australian, stripping them of the freedom to live an authentically human life. Because true freedom must include freedom of belief, of speech, of thought, of conscience. These are basic and essential human rights. And Australians agree. McCrindle research shows that nine in 10 of us believe people should have the freedom to share their religious beliefs if done in a peaceful way, even if those beliefs are different to mainstream community views. So what should be the role of the Religious Discrimination Bill? Well, for example, Australians of faith should be protected from discrimination on the basis of faith in the workplace. Parents must be free to educate their children according to their faith. The ability of faith-based schools to recruit staff who are of the same faith and to operate according to their faith should be protected. It should be unlawful for universities, trades and professional bodies to prevent their members from making a religious statement in public. And it should be illegal for people to be denied government services on the basis of their faith. The rise in hostility towards people of faith is alarming. All bullying is insidious behaviour that violates a victim's natural right to feel safe and secure, and we must be part of the answer. The same McCrindle research showed that more than three in four Australians say that the acts of kindness from churches in their local area make a positive difference to their community. Paul wrote that it's good to pray for a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way, the desired outcome of which is so that all people can be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And this surely is the ultimate good toward which religious freedom is oriented. And it is why we are engaged in weekly discussions with government as to how to achieve the best outcome for all. It won't be achieved through vilification laws which have the very real potential to increase existing animosity, not decrease. We should never withdraw from our neighbours for fear of offending them. We are to reach out in love. King Charles committed to follow the example of the King of Kings who came not to be served but to serve. And I close by encouraging us all to commit to the same attitude of serving one another in love. God bless you.